chapter 1, begin reading Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And while you're turning, one other thing that uh, we're involved with most years, and uh, I, was, well, I was reminded of that earlier this week, is of course we have the toys uh, that the Awana program has uh, provided toys for tots uh, and all of these that you provided uh, for the kids that are in foster care. Uh, it came to my attention several years ago, there was a forgotten group of kids in foster care, and that's the teenagers. Uh, of course, none of these toys would go to teenagers, nor would they want them to. And uh, for several years now, what we've done is, any of you who would like to help show some love to the teenagers that are in foster care, uh, if you will just hand me whatever money you would like to give to me, what we do is we buy gift cards for every teen that's in foster care. Usually there's about seven or eight or ten or so forth, and what we do is once we get the money, we just distribute it. Uh, I made a call to DHS, and we've been playing phone tag, and I couldn't catch them at their desk, and then they would catch me away from my phone. Hopefully tomorrow I'll get a number. And I believe I'll have all the way until next week to be able to take up the money, but I will find out hopefully tomorrow. I can always put out a, an email uh, or a text on our church text. If you'd like to give me some money today, you can hand it to me. Our brother Jeremy will be glad to get it there. Now let's show these teens some love. All of them are in foster care through no fault of their own. They're in a bad situation that uh, uh, no children should ever have to be in. So let's help them out with a special way. Not only is it good to get a gift, it's good to know somebody thought about you. Uh, so we're looking at, at Luke chapter 1, uh, verse 26. And this morning, I want to read out of the old King James. And you'll see why a little bit later on in the sermon. It's the one most familiar to us from when we were kids hearing the Christmas story. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Would you stand as the scriptures read, please? And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold thy cousin Elizabeth. She has also conceived a son in her old age. This is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days, and went into the hill country with haste, into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias, and saluted Elizabeth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you so much for the Christmas story. We thank you for the truths that are revealed, and your love for us. We ask that we would find the beauty in each and every detail. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I have to ask the question, where do you start with the Christmas story? Because obviously this is a good starting place for the Christmas story. But a lot of times we'll back up and start at an event that happened uh, six months earlier. And that is with Zacharias as he entered into 
uh, the, uh, the holy place. And the angel, of course, talked to him about the forerunner, the son that will be uh, born of him. But, but that's not even the start of it. Because as you realize, from the book of Genesis forward, God talks about the coming of the Messiah. But when December comes, you have to find a starting place. And I always like to start reading through the Christmas story. This year's starting place is right here. And as we look at the starting place, we understand that Luke, if you look at the introduction to his book, says the details are important. If you look at the details, you'll find some really beautiful messages. First of all, God starts with an unlikely place. In verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Nazareth. It's an unlikely place for where this thing would happen and where God would choose to go to start the greatest work of all eternity. Nazareth is unlikely because of its location. It was a city in Galilee. It was a region that was considered by the elite Jewish people in Jerusalem, which of course were the movers and shakers, and that was of course the capital, and that was where everything happened that was going to happen. And that's where all the cultural and the society and all the opinions and all the trends started. Well, there in Jerusalem, and of course it spread pretty much throughout the whole country, Galilee was considered less spiritual than the rest of the country. It was considered less cultured than the rest of the country because it's way out in the country. It was considered less civilized, sophisticated by the folks in Jerusalem. And it was close to Gentile territory, and oh, that made it bad. Because there were a lot of, lot of non-Jewish people that infiltrated down into Galilee. In fact, for over 500 years, it was known as Galilee of the Gentiles. So Nazareth was located in a very unpopular area to the elite Jews in their society. And we notice its size. Now, the King James and the New King James and other Bibles say it's a city called Nazareth. Well, it wasn't a city. It was a little bitty town, a village of maybe a few hundred. It was far away from any major trade route. It's kind of like some places around here. You don't go by there going anywhere. <laughs> Somebody was telling me yesterday at a funeral that they were, had a, fa uh, a family reunion at Mount Era Church over there in that corner of the county. And uh, they said, I couldn't find it. In fact, by the time I got there, everybody almost had left. There was one or two people there. He said, I couldn't find Mount Era. And I said, I would say that's not on your way to anywhere. But here it is. It's on my way to Spring Hill. If I got to go to Spring Hill, Sharon drove by there every day. But there's a lot of places around here. And a lot of times people will say, oh, I never drive down Highway 79 from Magnolia because that's not on our way to anywhere. Nazareth was not on your way to anywhere. It was so obscure that Josephus, the historian, as meticulous as he was and as lengthy as his book was on the antiquities of the Jews, he wrote the whole history of the Jewish country, it's not mentioned there. It's also not mentioned in any of the major writings by the rabbis of the time. In fact, it is not mentioned outside of the scriptures till probably about three or 400 AD. Now, critics jumped on this and said, aha, that means of course the Bible is all wrong. Nazareth didn't even exist in the day that Jesus was born simply because it's not mentioned in any other writings. Well, let's look at the proof. First of all, some practical considerations. Because the ones who want to claim that Nazareth didn't exist are the ones that want to claim that the whole Jesus story is a hoax. All right. If I'm going to have a hero in my made-up story... Don't you think I'm going to find a better town for them to come from? It's like having a hero and trying to pull that off today and saying my hero comes from Whoville. Well, that's a, that's a fictitious town by Dr. Seuss. And so I'm not going to say that a, a major hero that I'm trying to claim is a real person came from a fictitious town. The Gospels were circulated. 
during the time where most of the people that were alive at this time were still alive. They could fact check this, and that's become a popular term right now. They could fact check it. So we understand all the gospel writers talk about Nazareth. Peter's sermons in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 and chapter 4 verse 10, he talks about Jesus of Nazareth. Don't you think he would come up with a better place for Jesus to come from? And he's talking to the priest. Now, at that point, they could have said, now you can stop right there because there's no such town at this time. Critics say it didn't even come into existence than, than just later on. But we understand that they even ask about this. The scribes are quoted in Acts chapter 6 talking about Jesus of where? Nazareth. So we understand practical considerations tell us that Nazareth, even though it was not, a, it was not mentioned because it was so obscure, such a backwater town, it did exist. In fact, archaeological evidence. There we go, getting back to science. And you know what science has proven? Nazareth existed back to the point of 1,500 years earlier than Jesus. And as, er, as recent as 2009, they uncovered evidence around the current city of Nazareth that proved that Nazareth was in existence during the time period that Jesus Christ was born and lived. Current archaeologist named Ken Dark says any denial of the truthfulness of Nazareth is archaeologically unsupported. So what he's saying is, okay, follow the science. And the science said, yes, Nazareth did exist, but nobody knew about it because it was so, it was so small and tiny. Scripture points to this region. Scriptures point to this region. In fact, in John chapter 7, verse 41, and in verse 52, the leaders were saying, this man can't be the Messiah. Because look and see and search it. Can any prophet arise out of Galilee? And one prophet said, yes. So turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Well, let's back up to chapter 8, verse 22. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish. They shall be driven into darkness. Verse 1 of chapter 9. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun, the name of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Then skip down to verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order and establish it with judgment and justice from this time forward even forever. The zeal of the host will perform this. The light shines where? In Galilee of the Gentiles. It's as plain as it can be. And then... God breaks the silence of the centuries and comes to a virgin from Nazareth in the region of Galilee. So he chooses an unlikely place. So unlikely that, of course, Mary is troubled. It troubles her. She's concerned about what manner of greeting this is. People just didn't see angels every day. In fact, God had only revealed himself once in the last 400 years, and that was just a few months earlier to Zacharias. And we understand it's understandable that she would be concerned. 
But in his words to Mary, Luke reveals the major message of the Christmas story. In verse 30, he simply says, Fear not, Mary. Fear not. You see, this is not the first time that he, the angel has said that. A few months earlier, in chapter 1, verse 13, what does he tell Zacharias? The first words out of the angel's mouth that breaks the silence, breaks the silence of the centuries. Fear not, Zacharias. He comes to Mary and says, fear not. Chapter 2, verse 10, he says, fear not to the shepherds, to the first disciples when he called them in chapter 5, verse 10. He said, fear not, from now on you'll catch men. Seven times in the book of Luke, we hear the words, fear not. And did you know these words are used over 70 times in the scriptures? Do you think God has a message for us? Fear not. And why would he tell us this? Because there's plenty to disturb us. There's plenty to disturb us and break our hearts and cause us fear and cause us anxiety, cause us worry. So he tells us over and over again, fear not. And then he used the most effective message to, method to calm our fears. The most effective method to calm our fears is revealed here. And you have to pay attention to details to catch it. In verse 32, he will be great. He will be called the son of the highest. The Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David. Now you might say, wait a minute, he's introducing a brand new thought. Well, no, he isn't. And what he is doing to calm her fears is he's saying this. Remember what the Bible says? Because he's, when he talks about the throne of his father, David, every single Jewish person knew that he was talking about a promise that God made to Davis. David. You'll find it in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. Your house and your kingdom shall be established forever. Your throne will be established forever. He tells that to David. He says to David, your house, your kingdom, your throne will be established forever. And he uses the word forever twice in that passage of scripture. So the, the promise was given, but that's not the last time we have that promise. Turn to Psalms chapter 89, verse 34. Psalm chapter 89, verse 34. Psalm chapter 89, verse 34. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. His throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. And then that word selah means, you need to stop and think about that. He says, I did not lie to David. His throne will be forever. And you might say, well, of course, that would be in the Psalms because David wrote the Psalms. Didn't write this one. If you notice in your Bible, there's a superscription right above this psalm that says it was from Ethan the Ezraite. Now, I'm not sure who this man was, but it certainly wasn't David. And it was written sometime after David. And he wanted to remind the people, God did not lie to David. I'm reminding you that this promise is still valid. Then turn to Jeremiah chapter 23, hundreds of years later. Hundreds of years later, Jeremiah chapter 23, one of the most familiar of all the prophets to any Jewish person. Unmistakable what Jeremiah says. Chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will raise 
To David, a branch of righteousness, a king will reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness, a descendant of David and his throne forever. Now, if you pay attention to, of course, where these passages of scripture are, three different sections of the scripture. And the Jewish people knew these different sections. Samuel is the history part. Psalms called the writings in the poetry. Jeremiah is in the prophets. In three major sections of the scripture, God wanted to be sure that he got a reminder in of what he promised to David. And of course, the passage of scripture that we looked at in Isaiah talked about the throne of his father, David. Now, by the time of the angel's announcement to Mary, because of these scriptures, the coming Messiah would be known as the son of David. Some blind men were calling after Jesus, asking them to have mercy on him. And you know what they called him? Jesus, thou son of David. There was a Gentile woman whose daughter was very sick. And you know what she called him? Jesus, son of David. You remember the triumphant entry into Jerusalem? When Jesus went into Jerusalem and people waved palm branches? You know what they called him? Son of David. Now, the Jewish leaders became very upset because everybody knew what that meant. And Mary knew what it meant. And Mary knew that when he said... This child which shall be born will be of the seed of David and his throne will be established forever. She knew he's keeping that promise. She knew that. So she found comfort in the angel's words, but more than this, in the scriptures that backed up his words. Now, God's word also answered her greatest question. In verse 34, she said, how can this happen? Since I'm, a, I'm not even married yet. How can this happen? Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. God with us. And so she knew the answer to her question. That this was the, what God had promised all along. She found comfort and she found answers for her questions. And she found some sense in the biblical perspective. And that is exactly where we will find the answers to our questions. And we'll find the calmness for our fears right here in the biblical perspective. God has the answers to address our greatest fears. And then we have a little icing on the cake. This is the cake, but this is the icing on the cake. You know, it's amazing how God sometimes will throw the icing in just least expected times. So I was thinking about this passage of scripture. You know, when, when God calls you to preach, you're always working on a sermon. You're never, ever off the clock. It's always up here. You're always working on it. And earlier this week, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning. Woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And of course, naturally, you and, and I'm up anyway. So I began to think about the upcoming sermon. And then God gave me a little bit of icing on the cake. And that's why I read out of this passage of scripture, out of the King James. And here's the icing on the cake. And he gave it to me, and I, I hope maybe you'll see it too. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her that was called barren. Now, if you have a modern English translation, it says, your relative, Elizabeth. But oh, when I begin to think about this, and I heard that word, cousin, I realized something from my own past. From my own past, of course, is from my earliest memories, Christmas always involved cousins. It always involved cousins. Cousins were a big part of my life. Our cousins were like extended family. See, what happened is my mother and her sisters all migrated to El Dorado from down there in Atlanta when they got grown and moved out. And they lived 
within two blocks of each other. We all lived within two blocks of each other. And they were tight. They were close sisters. Then they started having kids. And all of us lived within just a few blocks of our cousins there. And of course, we were together all the time because the sisters were together all the time. And of course, in time, it became to be a pretty big group of us. And what would happen is, is every Christmas, we would all gather up at the grand folks' house. And every Christmas, we would all gather up at the grand folks' house, and it would just be magic. Why? Because all the cousins were there. And what a group of cousins it was. The first ones that came along, and let me just tell you this. There is no cool factor that matches an older cousin. <laughs> and the older cousins, Teresa and Jim and Sherry, came along first. By the time I was born, they were well on up, and they were older than I was, and they were just some of the coolest people I know. But then, then there was Ricky. Now, Ricky, 11 months difference between me and Keith. Oh, and it gets better. My dad, his brother, married sisters. So Ricky, double first cousin, along with Sherry. But I had a double first cousin that was just 11 months different. He was like the third twin. He was like every, we were together all the time. And then there was Tanya and Felicia and Renee and W.D. And then later on, a, a sister married to Crossit and Cliff from Crossit was born. Then, of course, you had Amy and Keith and Eric all in the mix. There's a dozen of us. Now, any two of us could fill a house up. But you had a dozen of us. And Christmas would come. Christmas would come. And we would all gather in. Now, my grandparents had a very small house there in Atlanta. It had four rooms in it. So they would send us outside with fireworks. <laughs> what could go wrong? Oh, it was great. It was great. And, and you know, year after year after year we went there. And, you know, it never really occurred to us that that ever end. And we never really realized how special that was until the grand folks began to pass away. Everybody got grown. Everybody got scattered. And then those days of get-togethers weren't there anymore. And you see, that's the icing on the cake. From the very start, God included cousins in Christmas. And, and here's, here's why I bring this all up. When I look back at those days and all those times together, I can't remember many of the presents I got. I can remember a few of them. I, and I appreciate it now that I didn't know it then, but I do now. My daddy worked hard. Daddy worked hard. And then, of course, any time you had to buy one present, you had to buy two because you had twins. And, and he worked hard. And not only did the best they could and provided some wonderful presents, but, you know, when I look back on that, I don't remember the presents. What I remember? The cousins. The cousins. And it comes down to this. You find that what makes life meaningful and what makes our days count is not stuff. It's relationships, isn't it? And at Christmas, we realize that more than ever. You know, you miss the folks who aren't with us all the time. But you really miss them around Christmas, don't you? And you really remember what a treasure we had. But watch this. Don't we still have it with each other? The ones that are here with us? Let's, let's consider them like the treasure that they are. From the very start, Christmas involved being with cousins. And it says very briefly, after this encounter, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house and greeted Elizabeth. Now, you have to understand what happened. In the Middle East, where they lived in Palestine, a greeting was a lengthy event. Now, we think a greeting, or King James says saluted, and it wasn't this. It meant a greeting 
uh, she didn't just walk in and say, hey, Elizabeth, what's up? That's not, how the, that's not how they greeted each other. It was a lengthy thing that where one of them began to tell the other one of the wonderful things that God had revealed to them. And both of them had a good story, didn't they? I mean, Elizabeth was, was old. I don't know how old she was. That she was really old. Zacharias was really old. And here was a miracle child coming along. And she said, you'll, you'll never believe what happened. And of course, she knew what had happened because the angel had talked about her cousin. And then Mary said, oh, let me tell you this. I'm having a baby too. And you see, Zacharias and Elizabeth knew that the baby they were going to have was going to be the forerunner of the coming Messiah. And then it gets better than that. Her cousin Mary is the mother of that coming king of the Jews. And so they greeted each other. And here's what they said. Isn't it wonderful that God included us in his plan? And we look around and say, man, that is wonderful. Again, it's something that God included two ladies that were cousins or relatives. And they had such a story to share with each other. But here's the last thing we look at in the Christmas story. We don't want to miss this. God has included us in the Christmas story. Because we look at this and, man, I'd like to be a shepherd and be included in the Christmas story. It'd be wonderful to be all included in that. Well, let's look at exactly what happened. John, who did not have any part of the nativity story in his gospel just summarized it in chapter 1 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us that's the christmas story isn't it that's the whole story in one sentence well jesus said it this way with a little extra in john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should never perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. That includes us. That's the Christmas story. That's the Christmas story and it includes us. Let me tell you what else includes us. Romans chapter 3 verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now what word is that? All of us. Every one of us. We're included in this passage of scripture. But then again. Two chapters later in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Who does that involve? All of us. Because all of us have sinned. All of us are sinners. And he loved us so much that he died for who? Us. Every one of us. We're included in the Christmas story. All of us are included in the Christmas story. And there's the joy of Christmas. There is the rock bottom foundation of the Christmas story is that we are included in what God did. But let's not forget this. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 28, uh, chapter 11, verse 28, come unto me all who labor and are heavy laden. Now, we would say it, all of you who are struggling and are loaded down. At one time or another, that's all of us, isn't it? That's all of us. And he said, Won't you come to me and I'll give you rest? See, no matter where you are today, you may not know Christ as your Savior, you may not even like Jesus. Jesus included you in the Christmas story, and you're included. He loves you. Can't make him not love you. He loves you enough to do what happened here and to come and dwell among men. He loves you. You need to come and know Jesus Christ and receive the best Christmas gift of all, and that'd be the gift of eternal life. But maybe there's other things going on. You're weighted down. All these prayer requests, the people that are facing crushing grief. He said, why don't you come and even if somebody else is burdened, why don't we lay it on the Lord? and find rest. I don't know where you are in the Christmas story, but we're in there. We're in there. Let's find peace with God this morning as we stand and see what number. Number 120. Mm -hmm.